How's it going guys? It is 1.49 a.m. 2nd of February here in Japan and we have a medium difficulty question for internal medicine, surgery, family medicine for 2CK. We're just saying for step one, some high yield points you need to know. Before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like. I really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-A-H-L, man underscore medical. Links down below. Find me on Telegram. Links to the Telegram group and channel are down below. Now start the clip. 49-year-old man, 12-hour painless loss of vision in his left eye. He smoked two packs of cigarettes daily for 30 years. Blood pressure 140 over 90. He has type 2 diabetes mellitus. Mentioned with metformin and glyburide. HbA1c is 8.5%. ECG shows signs of rhythm, which the following is most likely to reduce recurrence of this patient's acute presentation. So I'm just going to cut to the chase, all right, rather than going through each individual answer choice here. This is acute retinal artery occlusion. And I've made numerous clips on this before, but it's exceedingly high yield, okay? If a patient has acute retinal artery occlusion or a stroke or a TIA, you need to ask yourself, is this caused by a left atrial mural thrombus in the setting of AFib, or is it going to be carotid stenosis, okay, where you have a, an atheromata uh, carotid plaque that's launched off to the brain slash eye. Now, what you're going to do first is say, does the patient have eleva elevated blood pressure in, the, in this setting? In this case, yes, he does, okay? You say, well, that's not that high, 140 over 90. I mean, doesn't matter. I've seen 140 over 90 as hypertension in this scenario on 2CK stems. Doesn't have to be 180 over 100, okay? So this guy has high blood pressure. You need to know hypertension is the biggest risk factor for carotid stenosis, okay? Atheromata development. Uh, you've got uh, systolic impulse pounding those carotids, endothelial damage, okay? So atherosclerosis there. And if the patient does not have high blood pressure, then we would assume atrial fibrillation, okay? Classically older patients over the age of 70, 75, uh, where they have like a blood pressure 120 over 80, you wanna think AFib in particular, and you would do an ECG. US familiar, this can be challenging for students. They'll tell you in the question, ECG shows sinus rhythm, no abnormalities, but that's because atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal, meaning the patient goes home, pops into AFib for half an hour, pops out of it. So if they tell you the ECG is normal, uh, then you're going to do a Holter monitor as the next best step. In this case, however, we clearly have hypertension, so we're not thinking the AFib route, we're thinking the carotid stenosis route. So the next best step in diagnosis would be a carotid duplex ultrasound. If we're greater than 70% occlusion symptomatic or 80% occlusion asymptomatic, we're going to do a carotid endarterectomy. They don't give us that information here. So the next best step to reduce recurrence is simply lisinopril. This is the answer on one of the NBME forms. Okay, for 2CK. Now, as I preface with, I made many clips on this where if you are under the endarterectomy thresholds, they want a triad of an ACE inhibitor or ARB. Okay, so lisinopril is their favorite agent. Okay, so they want a triad. Number one, lisinopril. Number two, aspirin. Number three, statin. There's different antiplatelet therapies we can do. Aspirin alone, aspirin dipyridamol. We can do clopidogrel alone. US simply doesn't give a fuck. Aspirin's classically sufficient. Okay, so... The question, uh, there's another question on one of the NBME forms where it's pretty much the same thing, but then they just add the point. They say carotid uh, ultrasound shows 90% occlusion. Lisinopril is wrong answer, and they have endarterectomy as the correct answer. So that's the little tidbit you need to know. If you just get a blank uh, slate here where they don't mention the degree of occlusion, you're just going to go with lisinopril. Okay, you're going to go with aspirin, or you're going to go with a statin. They want that triad. Okay, I didn't list the other ones here for a reason, but blood pressure so that there's no confusion. Okay, we have a definite answer. You have to give all three if you're under the endarterectomy threshold. But lisinopril, as I said, they really want that blood pressure control. Okay, very, very important. Now, it's also more difficult because smoking cessation, wrong in this case, is classically a super fucking high yield answer just for general health on USMLE. They say what's most likely to decrease perioperative MI risk in a patient, smoking cessation. Patient has an MI, what's most likely to decrease another MI? Answer, smoking cessation, okay? Uh, so just general morbidity mortality, smoking cessation. So it's a frequent answer. But where it comes into play exceedingly high yield is, okay, for stroke, TIA, retinal artery occlusion, if a patient has high blood pressure, that exceeds smoking cessation in importance. And if we have a patient separately who has both atrial fibrillation and high blood pressure at the same time, then AFib eclipses hypertension. I have a high yield risk factors PDF. I'll link in the 
comments below. I'll pin it in the comments below where I talk all about this stuff in high level of detail. Uh, the diabetes, I put this buzzy answer in here that's wrong because there's a question on one of the clinical master series forms. Students ask all the time where this happens to be the correct answer, uh, where if they give you a high HbA1c, uh, that oftentimes we need to switch to insulin. In that particular question, the patient had a low bicarb, uh, which would mean lactic acidosis in the setting of metformin, so you would discontinue metformin. Glyburide, sulfonylurea, uh, requires functioning beta islet cells uh, to work. So if the patient has an HPA1C, you don't want to increase the dose of this. You want to just discontinue it. It's probably just the patient has pancreatic burnout already. So niacin therapy, nonsense answer. I don't think I've ever seen ni niacin. For 2CK, I mean, is nonsense, okay? I've never seen it as like an actual use case in that regard. Where what you do need to know about niacin, more for step one, is that mechanistically, this will decrease VLDL transport by the liver or secretion by the liver, okay? Uh, they'll say they want niacin decreases VLDL secretion by the liver. That's number one. Number two, niacin increases HDL more than any other therapy. So just mechanistically, you should be aware of that. Uh, but for actual use cases, I've never seen a question that's like, yes, give niacin. Never seen that before. Wrong fucking answer. So in short consolidation here, if you get a patient who has a TIA stroke, retinal artery occlusion, you say, is there high blood pressure? Yes or no. If there's high blood pressure, cryo duplex ultrasound. And if we're below the anatorectomy thresholds, triad of a statin, antiplatelet, ACE inhibitor ARB. If you're above, you're going to do endarterectomy. If you have normal blood pressure, then you're going to do ECG looking for atrial fibrillation. If the ECG is normal, sinus rhythm, no abnormalities, you're going to do a Holter monitor, 24-hour ECG monitor to pick up paroxysmal AFib. You know the deal. I'm going to continue to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. I appreciate your time. That's it.